even as we extend a warm welcome to each and every one, I want to bring your minds back to a time two weeks ago when we started talking about a subject. A subject that's tremendous when these words were a good reminder that many are called, but few are chosen. And we had started to look at where this was mentioned in the Bible, in two parables. I'm sure you all remember the two parables. One was about the parable of the workers in the vineyard, in Matthew chapter 20 from verse 1 to 16. And the other was actually about the parable of a wedding feast. And this was in Matthew chapter 22 from verses 1 to 14. Now what is important, just a quick refresher, is that God, to Him, what is very important is not just about what you want, what I want. It's about what He desires. And Jesus, when He came, one of the things that He talked about, and very important, 104 times, 110 times there are references in the four Gospels about this. And it's about the kingdom. There's a kingdom, and we need to understand this. As there's a kingdom of heaven, as a kingdom of the light, we know that the devil has also created a kingdom of hell and a kingdom of darkness. But in between, we understand this. God created a kingdom of the world, a kingdom of man. And perhaps you may not understand, you think that this kingdom of the world as a man is created for yours and my benefit. But not so. God had an intention right from the foundations of the earth. When he established a kingdom, when he stepped out of the heavenly dimension into darkness, when the kingdom was established for men, it was with the intention that the kingdom of heaven would be even right down here on earth. That you and I would not only be entitled to be part of the kingdom of heaven, but that we would be partakers of all the blessings and benefits of the kingdom. But with every blessings and benefits, there are always responsibilities and there are accountabilities. So the reality of the kingdom, the reality of the kingdom is something that a lot of people don't understand. In the time of Jesus, as he was talking so much about the kingdom, you remember the Pharisees came to him. And the Pharisees asked this question in the book of Luke. You know, you talk so much of the kingdom. When shall the kingdom come? And Jesus' reply gives us the first hint for how we should have the right perspective of the kingdom. Jesus replied saying, the kingdom does not come by observation, not by looking. It is not just say, ah, I see the kingdom. He said, neither shall they say, lo, here, lo, there. What we need to understand is not by seeking. Yes, the Bible challenges us to seek ye first the kingdom of God and the righteousness of the kingdom itself. Key word, not just seek the kingdom of righteousness. But Jesus said this, For behold, the kingdom is within you. For a long time, I didn't understand that until the Lord put this word in my heart. Remember, it's not by looking, it's not by seeking. It's within you because God wants you to live kingdom glory, kingdom power, kingdom authority, kingdom dynamics. It's about partaking. Amen. Not just looking, not just seeking. Partaking. That's the most critical part of the kingdom. That's why although Jesus came to bring salvation, to give to us the keys to the kingdom. But Matthew chapter 16, verse 19 reminds us. And it says, and I will give to you the keys of the kingdom. Not to the kingdom, not to open the door into the kingdom, but to be part and parcel of the kingdom. And the kingdom dynamics that happens. What happens? Direct open heaven connection. Connection between heavenly dimensions and earthly realities. Connection that every of those 7,487 promises that became a yes and an amen for us as New Testament saints. 
I want to tell you this. By your faith, you bring it down here. Kingdom realities. And he said, I gave you the keys of the kingdom. Direct connection. Whatever you shall bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you shall even release here on earth is released in heaven. I now tell you this, that Jesus came to make the connection again that you and I can be living here and now, but yet with the kingdom promises as a reality here and now. Not when you die. Not when you go up into the paradise, but right here and now. And this is important. But yet Jesus said these very words. Many are called. The few are chosen. And he spoke in parables. We try to understand that parables are like seemingly simple messages, but carries deep spiritual messages. Messages that it takes a spiritual mind to spiritually discern. It's not just about, yes, it talks about imagery. It is about description. It's about natural events. But these natural things that Jesus shared is about bearing a witness for spiritual dimensions to be lived, to be partaken in. So we saw the parable of the vineyard workers. And the lesson we learn is, do not keep looking from human and worldly perspectives. Two weeks ago, I touched about that. Because the vineyard worker, the first one, he was hired in the early hour, agreed to work for a denarius. Workers hired later, noontime, afternoon time. But what about those who are hired right at the last minute and they were all paid the same salary? The one who was hired in the morning was upset. Not fair. <laughs> Not fair. That guy who worked less hours than me got the same pay. And Jesus said it's very worse. The first will be last and last will be first. Then he says many are called but few are chosen. Actually, we understood, and I'm touching just as a refresher, when we look at it two weeks ago, we understood that this parable of the vineyard came from what? A question that was asked. A question that was asked by Peter in Matthew chapter 19, verse 27. And the question was, Behold, we have forsaken everything. We have given out everything and followed you. What shall be our reward? What will we do to us? And Peter said this because, again, to an answer to a question by another man. A rich young ruler that came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. And remember that, G that man asked a question, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I might have eternal life? And the answer he got was something he didn't like. He had fulfilled everything. He had done every commandment. He thought he was going to see, hear a compliment and say, Wow, well done. But instead, Jesus said to this rich young ruler, go, sell everything you have, then follow me. And this rich young ruler watched, walked away. And the Bible says because he was a man of great wealth. He could do everything, but yet did not do the needful thing. So Peter here now trying to be double saved, say, what about us? We're giving out everything now. What reward? Again, probably he didn't like to answer the parable. And the answer to the parable is not about your ability to work. It's not about reward for what you've done. It's about understanding the right perspective and even analogy to answer this. That the poor guy got paid more. Why was he the last? Probably he was a reject. You know, when you go in the old place to hire 
You know, when I was in India, I still see some places where there are workers waiting and these people come to get workers to work for the, in the fields. And you know, when they get, who get chosen first? The healthy, strong, and they get chosen. But here, the, probably the rejects were the last who were people who were lame, who were maimed, who nobody wanted. But they were paid the same wage, paid more than what they did. Why? Because of an act of mercy. Act of mercy by the landowner, whose just heart was moved by these people. But to the man who was hired early, it was about injustice. And he was reminded, did you not agree to work for the one denarius? Why do you get upset for my generosity to people? You see, this in our context, something that we have to remember as we are workers in the fields of our Lord. That is not about a reward for our labor, but a reward out of God's mercy. Do you know this is something that I'm always reminding, reminding myself? That I should never go to the Lord and say, what I've done and what's my remuneration? Do you know that God doesn't need us to work for Him? How many realize that? He created the world without us. He is going to redeem the world even without us. But yet, in His mercy, He decides in His grace to allow us to be co-laborers with Him. Co-laborers to work together. And we must understand, I labor today, at least, I hope, not because of the abilities God has given me. Not because the opportunities that God has given me. But I labor for Him today because of His mercy. I'm constantly reminded that when we're yet sinners, Christ came and died for us. Second thing, because of His mercy, He looked beyond my faults. And he saw the need I had for a saviour. This is something that we must begin to understand. Not only his mercy, but I'm constantly reminding myself that we must serve him because we love him. And why do we love him today? Can you love a God that you cannot see? Yes. We can. If we begin to understand that we are partakers first of His love. We love Him today because He first loved us. And this is something that is very important as a heart issue. And there should be an attitude of gratefulness and thanksgiving. We are grateful, I'm grateful at this, because of His mercy, because of His love, his love that reached out to me when I was on the road to hell. Some of you heard my testimony, right? Although I was born in a Christian family, good background, like perhaps like Paul, but I was still the soul. But in that state, God reached out. And this is something that Jesus trying to remember the disciples. Why do you follow me? Get your heart right. Do you follow me because of glory? Do you follow me because of reward? Or do you follow me because you have understood? And later Peter was to say this, but Lord, apart from you, where can we find the word of life? What is your motivation? And after having said that, now we come to the second parable, which I want to dwell for a little bit in on for this time. So if you've got your Bible, I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. And I want to read out, and I'm reading from the King James Version, uh, this parable. And this is a parable where the same words are to appear. And here in Matthew chapter, are you all there? Matthew chapter 22. And it starts with this word in verse 1. And Jesus answered and spoke unto them again by parables. 
So the first thing this tells us is, this parable was told by Jesus in answer to a question. Where did that question begin? And really the question begins in the chapter before that, from verse 42. And this was a time in the day of the life of Jesus. And he was teaching in, about certain things, about man's condition, man's heart. And he said these words, they never read in the scripture. The stones which the builders rejected, the same becomes the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. And it's the marvelous things in our eyes. Therefore, and therefore is always a conclusion. Therefore, I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken away from you. Wow. What a strong word. People who are given the kingdom of God, and yet you say the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to another nation. Keyword. How would the other nation, a nation in the Bible always talk about people grouping. How would the other nation or other people grouping be identified? Because they bring forth fruits. How many know that God not only expects fruitfulness for what He sows, He demands fruitfulness. Keyword, so lock that in. God demands fruitfulness for our lives. He paid the price to redeem us from darkness in Mother's life. Not because He wants to reward you, but He has a plan, He has a purpose for your life. I'll repeat this again. He has a plan, He has a purpose for your life. He has a destiny. And in Jeremiah 29, 11, He says, For I know the plans. Who knows? We think we know. God says He knows. He said, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. And there are plans of good and not evil, plans to give you hope and a future. You see, this is probably one of the biggest problems today. We can be living in this world facing hopelessness. Sometimes in situations, we face not only hopelessness, but helplessness. And if we're not careful, we can go in a state of depression because we not only lose hope, we may feel helpless about handling situations. And yet, and yet, we cannot understand that God has a plan. And perhaps this is one of the biggest problems. So he says, that plan for you is a good, not evil. Give you hope in the future. But God demands fruitfulness for your life. And this he made clear. And whosoever shall fall on his stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever he shall fall, he will grind him to powder. And what happened? So the Bible says the priests and the Pharisees, they heard this, what Jesus said, and they began to be unhappy. They began to plot. They begin to say, how do we destroy? You see, sometimes we get so consumed with ourselves. We get so sense of our own pride and elevation and where we put ourselves that we can lose touch when people come alongside to try even to tell us where our faults are. Too often, the messenger that carries bad news is the first to get a head chopped. But reality... So Jesus perceived that they were trying to scheme because they are happy with him. How dare you? We are the chosen people. We are the ones that God has selected. We have that legacy to Abraham. Moses has made that statement for our good. But you see, that message that don't just sit on your rights. Don't just sit in your privileges. Don't just sit thinking that what you have, you can possess and carry with you. Jesus said, if you don't respond in the right way, what is given may be lost. And here he was very strong about it. Given to another. Then other people grouping. 
Israel was so hardened in heart. They could not accept it. They forgot the call that God revealed to them. Right through the prophet that said, it's no light thing, Isaiah said, that you be what? God says, you be my instrument. You'll be a light unto the Gentiles. An instrument of salvation to the ends of the earth. I won't tell you this church. Israel blew it. But God is always the God of second chance. Amen? And it is written, Scripture, Paul says this, there were time for the redemption and salvation even of Israel. And all of Israel shall be saved. But in the meantime, that chosen nation might have lost it. But because of what they failed to receive, because they failed to even see the Messiah, because they failed to understand that with privileges, there is responsibilities and there is also accountability. Important. How we live our lives will determine where we end up. Don't think that just because I have accepted Jesus, I'm safe. That's where many people have been deceived. And I say, how do you know you're saved? How do you know you're saved? Oh, I know people reply, oh, because Romans 10, 10 says, if I believe in God as the one true God, if I believe Jesus Christ, He's His only Son that came and died for me and shed His blood for me, I am saved. I'm sorry, let me change the word. You are not saved, you are deceived. I'm serious. Did not the devil believe that God is the one true God? Did not the devil believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God? He did. Is there salvation for him? There isn't. Because the crux of that is not just about what you believe. What does Paul say? It's conjunctive. Believe one true God. Believe that Jesus Christ is Son of God who came and died for you. And conjunctive. Confess that he is Lord. Have you really allowed the Lordship of Jesus Christ to come into your life? Have you surrendered your own desires? Remember, the desires that we have comes from the flesh. And Paul warns us that there's no good thing in this flesh. Because of the flesh, the things that we want to do, we don't do. Because the flesh, the things we don't want to do, we do. How many still facing the same problem? Thank you for being honest. I'm serious. Because if you're honest and rec recognize your condition, then there is hope. But let's read these words now. After saying that to them, Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven, and he likens this, is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. So the king has prepared a marriage. He has prepared a marriage feast. Can you look at somebody and, and yeah, look at somebody and say, God's talking about you. <laughs> the Bible is talking at us as being the bride of Christ. God has prepared a wife, a bride for his son. Look again from the foundations of the earth. You were made not just to rule and to reign, but to be the bride. And a bride must be found worthy. There is a wedding feast to come. Somebody say amen. amen. And in that final day, there will be the wedding feast. And I pray that when that wedding feast takes place, all of us will be at that wedding feast. But look at this about the feast. So verse 3 says, So as he prepared his marriage, he sent forth his servants 
to call them that were bidden to the wedding. And they would not come. Now, notice this word. He sent out a call to them that were bidden, or the Greek word is to those that were elect, or those who were called. <laughs> he sent out a call to the called. Mm. Listen to this one. And they would not come. Wow, you know where I read this? I got shocked for a minute. He said, God, what are you saying? Today we are the elect. We are the chosen generation. We may not be the chosen nation, but we are still the chosen generation. We are the elect. We are the called. We are the bidden. Do you mean that some of us will not come? Go on, he says. So they don't come. And again, he sent forth other servants, saying, tell them which are bidden, which are called, which are the elect. Behold, I have prepared my fatlings are killed. And all things are ready. Come to the marriage. There will be a time and a season which is coming very soon when we're going to hear the Lord calling us to a marriage feast for His Son. But notice, what's the attitude towards Him? Verse 5 says, But they made light of it. They treated it as nothing. Like yo. Nothing. And they went about their ways. One to the farm, another one to his business, merchandise. You see, the Lord wants us, many of us may not even hear the call. When the final trump sounds and the Lord says, come on! Amen. I believe in the rapture of the church. Amen. But some will say, even they hear the call, they may be so busy, not yet, not yet. I still got business to attend to. I still got things to look after. The affairs of the world, the things of the world, the cares of the world can distract us. And here is it. Next verse. But there are some who took his servants and treated them and treated them spitefully and even killed them. Remember the words of Jesus, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You who killed the prophets. But when the king heard this, he was angry. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their cities. People of God, the time of accountability draws near. I didn't say final judgment yet, but I said the time of accountability draws near. Lord has given us as a ministry a word to release from 208. That we're going to see a shaking like never before. And all that will be shaken can be shaken. And 208, the Lord calls us to release this word from very word from scriptures. As God shake the nations, judgment must begin at the house of God. How would God even begin to judge the nations if He first does not judge His own? The time of accountability is coming, people of God. Don't get so caught up with the cares of the world. Remember something. We came into this world with nothing. The Bible warns us naked we came. Nothing. And we shall surely leave this time, this era, this season with nothing. When the time we are called in the presence of God, when the time, whether through death or through that trump, that call, the rapture of the church, I believe, we're going to leave it with nothing. Whatever you laid up here will account for nothing. Very important. So let's carry on here what they say. Then after God destroyed them, verse 9 says, Instructions, first fresh instructions given. Go you therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid them to the, mar to the marriage. Go, go, go. Look for those people out the high roads, the low roads, everywhere. And what do you say here? So those servants went out into the highways 
and gathered together all as many can be found. Notice this word. Both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. Verse 11. So the whole hall festivities was there. Singing, food, everything already. And now the Bible says, verse 11, And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which did not have on a wedding garment. Now we must understand in those days, when you come in, the wedding feast, the host would actually give a garment. Maybe the garment was a thing that was equal, so that whoever come to, into the wedding feast is treated equally. It's not that you, by your rank, you recognize. You can wear clothes that will show your rank. But when you wear the wedding garment, all guests are the same. It reminds me of a promise that there was a time Revelation talked about when the saints shall be clothed with garments of righteousness. But you see, he came in and there was all the rest wearing the garments. But there was one man. This man was not wearing a wedding garment. Why? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say so. But what clearly was, is not, the Bible didn't say there was a lack, there was no lack of garments for him. He cannot say, oh, I don't like it, wrong size. Obviously, these garments, you know, will have sizes. And you could choose sizes. Maybe he didn't like the garment because, hmm, where where this? I am like everybody else. There's some of us like to wear clothes that make us stand out and make us different. I know I'm not talking about people in this church. Don't worry. <laughs> right? And whatever the reason, this guy had a reason. So simple to put on a garment, but by choice, he chose not to. We can sit here and deliberate and talk and talk. Why did the guy do a simple thing and put in garment? They did not know that the king would come and he would stand out like a sore thumb. Well, I believe this guy had an attitude problem. He had a couldn't be bothered attitude, perhaps. He just what's up, lah? Chinese say, don't care. You find that people like that also in a church. Even a church, they are sheep, true. But they're goats. I've, I've talked about it. And goats and sheep are the same category. But yet in personality, they are different. And sometimes we don't like to be conforming. We want to be outstanding. But we don't understand the word outstanding. I used to joke about it. I say I was a very outstanding student in class. Every time the teacher came in, I was outside standing. <laughs> and there's something to look at. Because when the king came in, this guy stood out. He was so outstanding that he was really made to be outside standing. Yeah, listen to this. So what did the king say? He saw the guest. He said, friend, how come you come in here not having a wedding garment? What's wrong with you? The man had no reason, no excuse. He knew. How many know that when we come to church, there are rules and conditions? We are in a state of war right now, if you don't know. There's a war between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of hell. There's a war between the kingdom of the light and the kingdom of darkness. Wake up, people! Whether you like it or not, in that war that's going on, there's no such thing as, I just want to be a bystander. I'm telling you this, when war takes place, when two armies fight, poor innocent civilians, well-meaning civilians, civilians that don't want to get involved, are still hurt and killed. But in this war that's on now, I want to tell you this, there's no option. You have to choose sides. There's no sitting on the fence. Because this war is raging. And the intent between the war of good and evil is for one reason. 
the souls of men and women today. I will repeat it. Your soul, my soul, our respective souls are the prize that the devil wants to come to kill, to steal and destroy. So church, we've got to wake up. I hear a soldier over that we get an encounter. We talked about a subject and a theme the Lord gave us. Was, Prepare for war. There's a state of war that exists. And there is no option. You can't choose to be bystanders. Because your soul is a prize that a Satan wants. Your soul is a prize when he went from being Lucifer, angel of light, archangel of worship, to become Satan, enemy of God. And that enemy doesn't care. He wants to hurt God every way he can. You are the apple of his eye. He loves you. And he sent his only beloved son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish. And the price has been paid. The choice of God has been made. Now, you make the choice. Choice not only to be part of the kingdom, but choice to be partakers of the kingdom. Look at the poor man, what happened to him. Then said the king to servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What is this outer darkness? You heard me preach about this. That my understanding of outer darkness is this. There will be a time when the kingdom of heaven is going to come physically onto the earth. The city of Jerusalem will be here. Yes, before that, there's going to be events that take place. Horrible war that even one third of the world will become uninhabitable. Salvation seems to be impossible. The Bible talks about half the world population will be destroyed. But yet the kingdom will be down here. And in that kingdom down here, 1,000 years of millennium reign, where Jesus will rule with a rod of iron. But you know, the, this city of Jerusalem has 12 gates. And what are gates? Gates are points of entry. And these gates are guarded by angelic beings. That there are people, therefore, out there who can see the kingdom, who can see the goodness and, wow, everything is happening in the kingdom. But you know why weeping national of teeth? Great regret. Because they can see and yet cannot be partakers. Not just for one year. Not for two years, not 100 years even. For 1,000 years. I'm not talking about loss of salvation. Because there's a time later after that of judgment again. But can you just understand people of God? What it means to be deprived of the inheritance, to be partakers of the kingdom. God did not die that you just be saved in a sweet bye-bye. He paid the price that you can be living His kingdom dynamics, kingdom glory, kingdom power, kingdom provision, kingdom providence, kingdom abundance, right here and now. Amen. Amen. It took me a long time to work it out. But don't get deceived like the man who said, all that I have today is because of the strength of my arm. Are you still believing that it's your own ability, your own strength, your own arm that got you what you have? Be careful. Because you can lose the heart of gratefulness. You can lose the heart of thanksgiving. And you know, I'm going to preach about this two weeks down the road. Thanksgiving that brings to praise, that brings to worship. Amen. For those who are prepared, read Psalm 95. And this is important. So we have this parable told because of opposition. We have this parable told for a reason. About 
Rejection, not by God, but rejection by people who are invited. And leading to destruction. We see invitation by grace extended to people who are not worthy. But that's grace. And grace is coupled with the mercy of God. Invitation then was extended to the Gentiles. How many of you are Gentiles? I was not born a Jew, therefore I was a Gentile. <laughs> and I've said, what is the problem really? It's not about not being in a feast. It's about not wearing out the garment. What is the reason? Don't know. But you've got to ask, am I like the man? As I meditated upon this parable, I want to tell you this. I saw there were two calls, really. Many are called. There's a call for salvation. And many are called. Second, there was an even deeper call, an internal call, if you like. A call to going beyond lip service, just a confession that I am. What? A servant. Paul didn't use the word servant. You know, Paul used the word doulos, which really better translated me, I'm a slave of God. I got no more rights. I got nothing. Do you know a slave learns to be grateful if he's got a good master because a good master would take care of him and provide for him? Somebody say amen. amen. Internal call to go beyond just lip service. There's an internal call, I want you to hear this, for a change. Change of attitudes. For a change, a change of transformation. For a change where God gave His Holy Spirit for that reason. That there be a change. That out of your belly then flow rivers of living water. I will tell you this. May permit me to use your story. We have May sitting in our midst here. Yeah, good. Wave. Amen. May has been going through some difficult personal issues. She's had a struggle. She's been praying, God, I need this solution. But she came to a weekend encounter. And you know, the word that we gave to her is that, don't worry about crying, because she felt that she should not cry. But I said, look, God said, those that sow in tears, you're going to reap in joy. But when there's a time you reap in joy, and she reaped in joy the night before. When there's time of ministry, and she answered a second call, and she was just before God crying. And she just said, God, I need you. All of a sudden, her focus changed from just, God, I need an answer. To God, I need you. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God came for her. She went out anointing, she came out in tongues. How many of you were there? Remember her testimony after that? And all of a sudden, her whole demeanor changed. She shared the testimony the next day, the whole night. Wow, she saw angels in her dreams, in her sleep, right? She saw faces, and all of a sudden, she was praying the whole night. Her roommate, Susan, said, wow, she developed a different type of snore. <laughs> Foreign language, she was going the whole night. And the whole night, she was no longer praying for her own needs. She saw the face of this person. She saw the face of that person. She began to pray for others. And next day when she came into, I mean, when time of devotion, I came in later, time of breakfast, I saw her. There was a total change. No more papaya face. <laughs> there was a joy. Amen. You see, when you look beyond your problems, to look through the eyes of faith, where you can begin to see through the eyes of Jesus, when you begin to discern with the mind of Christ, I want to tell you this. You don't see defeat. You see the victory that's already prepared for you and I. Amen. You don't see a need for a breakthrough because you have a confidence God can break you out of whatever situations, whatever problems, whatever things you're going through. I want to hear a loud amen today. Amen. You see... There's a call, not only for change. In this parable, there's a call for repentance. 
There's a call for us to change our attitudes, to turn from our wicked ways. You know, that's what Second Chronicles say. If my people were called by my name, will first humble themselves and pray, God said. Not just pray, seek God's face. Do you know what happens when you see the face of God? It's like a prophet, woe is me, I'm undone. I've seen the glory of God. I'm a man of unclean lips. Wow, that's worship. When all of a sudden it's just not praise, but you drop down. Worship is seeing the worth of God. I won't tell you this. You'll feel undone because you realize how sinful you are. But that's when repentance turns into true faith. Repentance stops you looking at your problems to begin to look through the eyes of Jesus to see the glory and see the outcome. And all of a sudden, you have the confidence. Whatever I'm going through today is nothing compared to what God has laid out for us in eternity. Whatever time you are going through that's difficult, there's nothing compared to the eternity with God. You have an inheritance. And I want you to hear this. The key to the inheritance is obedience, submission, that you can be partakers. With this, I will close. My time is up. But I pray right now you catch this message. Many are called, but few are chosen. How many know that you're all chosen? You're all predestined. Romans 8 tells us to be conformed to the image of Christ. You're all predestined to be sons and daughters of God. God already predestined you. But don't fall short and lose your destiny. You lose your destiny. Can be by default. You lose your destiny by having a cannot be bothered attitude. You lose your destiny because you have not learned to come to understand, to treasure, and not let go of what God has for you. Amen. Let's quieten our hearts now. Father, I give you thanks, I give you praise. You remind us that you have a destiny for each and every one of us. You have a substance ready as a foundation for that destiny. You have a place of significance, God, that we can be in. But God, I give you thanks right now. I see men and women, there will be women of influence for you. What is God's plan? What's God's purpose for your life? The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Get your priorities right. I said something to students last night. Four things to understand if you seek to encounter God. You need intentionality. You must be intentional about setting time to seek God. Not by the way, not when you have the time, not when you feel like it. You must be focused when you seek God. And focus means you must get your priority right. You have to be persistent. Because as you seek, as Satan is going to come distract you. He's going to distract you with the cares of the world. He's going to distract you with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Another thing, when you seek God, you have to be patient. It's His timing, not your timing. It's His glory, not your glory. It's His purpose and not your purpose. It's for this reason that the Son of God died for you. That His glory might be manifest in and through you. That the works of the evil one can be destroyed. Guess who's going to destroy it now? You. Me. We together. So Father, I thank you for even a conviction that will flow in our midst. A desire, God, not just a desire to be thankful that we are in the kingdom, but a desire to be partakers of the kingdom. 
To be able to say, Father, not my will, but yours be done. To be able to say, God, truly, I am not only the child, I am the firstborn of a living God. So, Father, to you be all glory, all honour, all power, even right now. To you, Lord, we submit our lives. To you, Lord, we come in worship. And we give you thanks. We give you Holy Spirit praise even right now. As you move in our midst as the spirit of conviction. As you move in our midst to stir us, Lord, to understand not only a call of salvation, but a call of repentance and faith. And a call that we can be submitted and obedient to your will, O Lord. So this we give you all thanks, glory, power, honour and praise right now. In Jesus' name.